Section 5 of Your Mind and How to Use It by William Walker Atkinson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 11 The Emotions. As we have seen in the preceding lessons, an emotion is the more complex phase of feeling. As a rule, an emotion arises from a number of feelings. Moreover, it is of a higher order of mental activity. As we have seen, a feeling may arise either from a physical sensation or from an idea. Emotion, however, as a rule, is dependent upon an idea for its expression and always upon an idea for its direction and its continuance. Feeling, of course, is the elemental spirit of all emotional states and, as an authority has said, is the thread upon which the emotional states are strung. Halleck says, when representative ideas appear, the feeling in combination with them produces emotion. After the waters of the Missouri combine with another stream, they receive a different name, although they flow toward the gulf in as great volume as before. Suppose we liken the feeling due to sensation to the Missouri River, the train of representative ideas to the Mississippi before its junction with the Missouri. Emotion may then be likened to the Mississippi after its junction, after feeling has combined with representative ideas. The emotional stream will not be broader and deeper than before. This analogy is employed only to make the distinction clearer. The student must remember that mental powers are never actually as distinct as two rivers before their union. The student must beware of thinking that we have done with feeling when we consider emotion. Just as the waters of the Missouri flow on until they reach the gulf, so does feeling run through every emotional state. In the above analogy, the term representative ideas, of course, means the ideas of memory and imagination, as explained in previous chapters. There is a close relation between emotion and the physical expression thereof, a peculiar mutual action and reaction between the mental state and the physical action accompanying it. Psychologists are divided regarding this relation. One school holds that the physical expression follows and results from the mental state. For instance, we hear or see something, and thereupon experience the feeling or emotion of anger. This emotional feeling reacts upon the body and causes an increased heartbeat, a tight closing of the lips, a frown and lowered eyebrows, and clenched fists. Or we may perceive something which causes the feeling or emotion of fear, which reacts upon the body and produces pallor, raising of the hair, dropping of the jaw, opening of the eyelids, trembling of the legs, etc. According to this school and the popular idea, the mental state precedes and causes the physical expression. But another school of psychology, of which the late Professor William James is a leading authority, holds that the physical expression precedes and causes the mental state. For instance, in the cases above cited, the perception of the anger-causing or fear-causing sight first causes a reflex action upon the muscles, according to inherited race habits of expression. This muscular expression and activity, in turn, is held to react upon the mind and to cause the feeling or emotion of anger or fear, as the case may be. Professor James, in some of his works, makes a forcible argument in support of this theory, and his opinions have influenced the scientific thought of the day upon this subject. Others, however, have sought to combat his theory by equally forcible argument and the subject is still under lively and spirited discussion in psychological circles. Without taking sides in the above controversy, many psychologists proceed upon the hypothesis that there is a mutual action and reaction between emotional mental states and the appropriate physical expression thereof, each in a measure being the cause of the other, and each, likewise, being the effect of the other. For instance, in the cases above cited, the perception of the anger-producing or fear-producing sight causes, almost or quite simultaneously, the emotional mental state of anger or fear, as the case may be, and the physical expression thereof. Then rapidly ensues a series of mental and physical reactions. 
the mental state acts upon the physical expression and intensifies it. The physical expression, in turn, reacts upon the mental state and induces a more intense degree of the emotional feeling. And so on, until the mental state and physical expression reach their highest point and then begin to subside from exhaustion of energy. This middle ground conception meets all the requirements of the facts and is probably more nearly correct than either extreme theory. Darwin, in his classic work, The Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals, has thrown a great light on the subject of the expression of emotion in physical motions. The Florentine scientist, Paolo Mantegazza, added to Darwin's work with ideas of his own and countless examples drawn from his own experience and observation. The work of François del Sartre, the founder of the school of expression which bears his name, is also a most valuable addition to the thought on this subject. The subject of the relation and reaction between emotional feeling and physical expression is a most fascinating one, and one in which we may expect interesting and valuable discoveries during the next twenty years. The relation and reaction above mentioned are interesting, not only from the viewpoint of theory, but also because of their practicable application in emotional development and training. It is an established truth of psychology that each physical expression of an emotional state serves to intensify the latter. It is pouring oil on the fire. Likewise, it is equally true that the repression of the physical expression of an emotion tends to restrain and inhibit the emotion itself. Halleck says, If you watch a person growing angry, we shall see the emotion increase as he talks loud, frowns deeply, clenches his fist, and gesticulates wildly. Each expression of his passion is reflected back upon the original anger and adds fuel to the fire. If he resolutely inhibits the muscular expressions of his anger, it will not attain great intensity, and it will soon die a quiet death. Not without reason are those persons, called cold-blooded, who habitually restrain, as far as possible, the expression of their emotion who never frown or throw any feeling into their tones, even when a wrong inflicted upon someone demands aggressive measures. There is here no wave of bodily expression to flow back and augment the emotional state. In this connection we call your attention to the familiar and oft-quoted passage from the works of Professor William James. Refuse to express a passion, and it dies. Count ten before venting your anger, and its occasion seems ridiculous. Whistling to keep up courage is no mere figure of speech. On the other hand, sit all day in a moping posture, sigh and reply to everything with a dismal voice, and your melancholy lingers. There is no more valuable precept in moral education than this, as all who have experience know. If we wish to conquer undesirable emotional tendencies in ourselves, we must assiduously and in the first instance, cold-bloodedly, go through the outward movements of those contrary dispositions which we prefer to cultivate. Smooth the brow, brighten the eye, contract the dorsal rather than the ventral aspect of the frame, and speak in a major key, and your heart must be frigid indeed if it does not gradually thaw. Along the same lines, Halleck says, Actors have frequently testified to the fact that emotion will arise if they go through the appropriate muscular movements. In talking to a character on the stage, if they clench the fists and frown, they often find themselves becoming really angry. If they start with counterfeit laughter, they find themselves growing cheerful. A German professor says that he cannot walk with a schoolgirl's mincing step and air without feeling frivolous. The wise student will acquire a great control over his emotional nature if he will re-read and study the above statements and quotations until he has grasped their spirit and essence. In those few lines he is given a philosophy of self-control and self-mastery that will be worth much to him if he will but apply it in practice. Patience, perseverance, practice and will are required, but the reward is great. Even to those who have not the persistency to apply this truth fully, 
there will be a partial reward if they will use it to the extent of restraining, so far as possible, any undue physical expression of undesirable emotional excitement. Some writers seem to regard capacity for great emotional excitement and expression as a mark of a rich and full character or noble soul. This is far from being true, while it is a fact that the cultivation of certain emotions tends to create a noble character and a full life. It is equally true that the tendency to gush and indulge in hysterical or sentimental excesses is a mark of an ill-controlled nature and a weak rather than strong character. Moreover, it is a fact that excess in emotional excitement and expression tends toward the dissipation of the finer and nobler feelings which otherwise would seek an outlet in actual doing and practical action. In the language of the old Scotch engineer in the story, they are like the old locomotive, which has been so much steam at the whistle that she has nothing to gear by. Emotional excitement and expression are largely dependent upon habit and indulgence, although there is a great difference, of course, in the emotional nature and tendencies of various persons. Emotions, like physical actions or intellectual processes, become habitual by repetition and habit renders all physical or mental actions easy of repetition. Each time one manifests anger, the deeper the mental path is made, and the easier it is to travel that path the next time. In the same way, each time that anger is conquered and inhibited, the easier will it be to restrain it the next time. In the same way, desirable habits of emotion and expression may be formed. Another point in the cultivation, training and restraint of the emotions is that which has to do with the control of the ideas which we allow to come into the mind. Ideative habits may be formed, are formed, in fact, by the majority of persons. We may cultivate the habit of looking on the bright side of things, of looking for the best in those we meet, of expecting the best things instead of the worst by resolutely refusing to give welcome to ideas calculated to arouse certain emotions, feelings, passions, desires, sentiments, or similar mental states, we may do much to prevent the arousing of the emotion itself. Emotions usually are called forth by some idea, and if we shut out the idea, we may prevent the emotional feeling from appearing. In this connection, the universal rule of psychology may be applied. A mental state may be inhibited or restrained by turning the attention to the opposite mental state. The control of the attention is really the control of every mental state. We may use the will in the direction of the control of the attention, the development and direction of voluntary attention, and thus actually control every phase of mental activity. The will is nearest to the ego, or central being of man, and the attention is the chief tool and instrument of the will. This fact cannot be repeated too often. If it is impressed upon the mind, it will prove to be useful and valuable in many emergencies of mental life. He who controls his attention controls his mind, and in controlling his mind, controls himself. End of chapter 11 Chapter 12 The Instinctive Emotions Many attempts to classify the emotions have been made by the psychologists, but the best authorities hold that beyond the purpose of ordinary convenience in considering the subject, any classification is scientifically useless by reason of its incompleteness. As James cleverly puts it, any classification of the emotions is seen to be as true and as natural as any other, if it only serves some purpose. The difficulty attending the attempted classification arises from the fact that every emotion is more or less complex and is made up of various feelings and shades of emotional excitement. Each emotion blends into others. Just as a few elements of matter may be grouped into hundreds of thousands of combinations, so the elements of feeling may be grouped into thousands of shades of emotion. It is said that the two elements of carbon and hydrogen form combinations resulting in 5,000 varieties of material substance, from anthracite to marsh gas, from black coke to colourless naphtha. 
the same thing may be said of the emotional combinations formed from two principal elements of feeling. Moreover, the close distinction between sensation and feeling, on the one hand, and between feeling and emotion, on the other, serves to further complicate the task. For the purposes of our consideration, let us divide the emotions into five general classes, as follows. 1. Instinctive emotions. 2. Social emotions. 3. Religious emotions. 4. Aesthetic emotions. 5. Intellectual emotions. We shall now consider each of the above five classes in turn. The Instinctive Emotions Instinct is defined as unconscious, involuntary, or unreasoning prompting to any action, or the natural, unreasoning impulse by which an animal is guided to the performance of any action, without thought of improving the method. An authority says, Instinct is a natural impulse leading animals, even prior to all experience, and to perform certain actions tending to the welfare of the individual or the perpetuation of the species apparently without understanding the object at which they may be supposed to aim, or deliberating as to the best methods to employ. In many cases, as in the construction of the cells of the bee, there is a perfection about the result which reasoning man could not have equalled, except by an application of the higher mathematics to direct the operations carried out. Mr. Darwin considers that animals, in time past, as now, have varied in their mental qualities, and that those variations are inherited. Instincts also vary slightly in a state of nature. This being so, natural selection can ultimately bring them to a high degree of perfection. It was formerly the fashion to ascribe instinct in the lower animals, and in man, to something akin to innate ideas implanted in each species, and thereafter continued by inheritance. But the application of the idea of evolution to the science of psychology has resulted in brushing away these old ideas. Today, it holds that that which we call instinct is the result of gradual development in the course of evolution, the accumulated experience of the race being stored away in the race memory, each individual adding a little thereto by his acquired habits and experiences. Psychologists now hold that the lower forms of these race tendencies are closely akin to purely reflex actions, and the higher forms, which are known as instinctive emotions, are phenomena of the subconscious mind resulting from race memory and race experience. Claude says, Instinct is the higher form of reflex action. The salmon migrates from sea to river. The bird makes its nest or migrates from one zone to another by an unvarying route, even leaving its young behind to perish. The bee builds its six-sided cell. The spider spins its web. The chick breaks its way through the shell, balances itself, and picks up grains of corn. The newborn babe sucks its mother's breast, all in virtue of like acts on the part of their ancestors, which, arising in the needs of the creature, and gradually becoming automatic, have not varied during long ages, the tendency to repeat them being transmitted within the germ from which insect, fish, bird, and man have severally sprung. Schneider says, It is a fact that men, especially in childhood, fear to go into a dark cavern or a gloomy wood. This feeling of fear arises, to be sure, partly from the fact that we easily suspect that dangerous beasts may lurk in these localities, a suspicion due to stories we have heard and read. But, on the other hand, it is quite sure that this fear, at a certain perception, is also directly inherited. Children who have been carefully guarded from all ghost stories are nevertheless terrified and cry if led into a dark space, especially if sounds are made there. Even an adult can easily observe that an uncomfortable timidity steals over him in a lonely wood at night, although he may have the fixed conviction that not the slightest danger is near. This feeling of fear occurs in many men, even in their own houses, after dark, although it is much stronger in a dark cavern or forest. The fact of such instinctive fear is easily explicable when we consider that our savage ancestors, 
through immemorial generations, were accustomed to meet with dangerous beasts in caverns, especially bears, and were, for the most part, attacked by such beasts during the night and in the woods, and that thus an inseparable association between the perceptions of darkness, caverns, woods, and fear took place, and was inherited. James says, Nothing is commoner than the remark that man differs from lower creatures by the almost total absence of instincts, and the assumption of their work in him by reason. We may confidently say that, however uncertain man's reactions upon his environment may sometimes seem, in comparison with those of the lower mammals, the uncertainty is probably not due to their possession of any principles of action which he lacks. On the contrary, man possesses all the impulses that they have, and a great many more besides. High places cause fear of a peculiarly sickening sort, though here again individuals differ. The utterly blind instinctive character of the motor impulses here is shown by the fact that they are almost always entirely unreasonable but that reason is powerless to suppress them. Certain ideas of supernatural agency, associated with real circumstances, produce a peculiar kind of horror. This horror is probably explicable as a result of a combination of simple horrors. To bring the ghostly terror to its maximum, many unusual elements of the dreadful must combine, such as loneliness, darkness, inexplicable sounds, especially of a dismal character, moving pictures half discerned, or, if discerned, of dreadful aspect, and a vertiginous baffling of the expectation. In view of the fact that cadaveric, reptilian, and underground horrors play so specific and constant a part in many nightmares and forms of delirium, it seems not altogether unwise to ask whether these forms of dreadful circumstance may not, at a former period, have been more normal objects of the environment than now. The evolutionist ought to have no difficulty in explaining these terrors and the scenery that provokes them, as relapses into the consciousness of the cavemen, a consciousness usually overlaid in us by experiences of a more recent date. Instinctive emotion manifests as an impulse arising from the dim recesses of the feeling or emotional nature an incentive toward a dimly conscious end. It differs from the almost purely automatic nature of certain forms of reflex process, for its beginning is a feeling arising from the subconscious regions, which strives to excite an activity of conscious volition. The feeling is from the subconscious, but the activity is conscious. The end may not be perceived in consciousness, or at least is but dimly perceived but the action leading to the end is in full consciousness. Instinct is seen to have its origin in the past experiences of the race, transmitted by heredity and preserved in the race memory. It has for its object the preservation of the individual and of the species. Its end is often something far removed in time from the moment, or the welfare of the species, rather than that of the individual. For instance, the caterpillar providing for its future states, or the bird building its nest, or the bees building cells and providing honey for their successors, for very few bees live to partake of the honey which they have gathered and stored. They are animated by the spirit of the hive. The most elementary forms of the instinctive emotions are those which have to do with the preservation of the individual, his comfort, and purely physical welfare. This class of emotions comprises what are generally known as purely selfish feelings, having little or no concern for the welfare of others. In this class we find the emotional feelings which have to do with the satisfaction of hunger and thirst, the securing of comfortable quarters and warm clothing, and the spirit of combat and strife arising from the desire to obtain these. These elemental feelings had their birth early in the history of life, and indeed life itself depended very materially upon them for its preservation and continuance. It was necessary for the primitive living thing to be selfish. When man appeared, only those survived who manifested these feelings strongly. The others were pushed to the wall and perished. Even in our civilization, the man below the average in this class of feelings will find it difficult to survive. 
End of chapter 12 End of section 5